even though it is ever so hot today in the UK, I am going to be um, using the webcam. Hi, welcome. Welcome to today's session. So my name is Mark. I'm the Managing Director at uh, TMSDI. And here we look after supporting organisations, teams and leaders in having powerful, impactful conversations through the use of the full systemic approach that is offered by the psychometrics in the TMS suite of tools. So my background's in psychology and alongside this role I, I do work as an executive coach and team facilitator um, and I'm tremendously privileged to be, be able to collaborate with amazing teams uh, and leaders across Europe, Middle East and Africa which is our remit at TMSDI. And we're going to be looking at two of those psychometrics in the suite um, as part of today's session which is all about enhancing your approach and enhancing coaching conversations, adding a different dimension to those. So more on those shortly. Um, before I do that, I'm thrilled to hand over to our guest, Tom. Uh, so Tom Gibbons is the Managing Director of TMS Americas. Now any eagle-eyed uh, participants, you might notice that that skyline is a beautiful image, but there's no accident that we've just chosen a beautiful image. It's the Ontario uh, skyline. And uh, Tom is actually joining us from his home office uh, over in London, Ontario, in Canada. Um, Tom, over to you. Okay, Mark, thanks. And this is um, our first coll collaboration uh, on, a, on a web meeting, which is fun. And um, so if, I'm not sure, I don't see the Toronto skyline on my uh, slide right now, but um, um, I'm about two hours west of Toronto in, um, uh, London, Ontario, and we are a total wannabe of uh, <laughs> the, the real London, I guess you could call it, but we, we do have a Thames River in our town of 350,000 people, and we do have a Covent Garden market, so um, we always say we're a wannabe of the, uh, of the real London in the, in the UK. So it, it is great to be here. Um, I am the Managing Director of TMS America, so a colleague of Mark and the awesome team over there and other distributors around the world for TMS. Um, I've been around organizations longer than I like to remember. I spent 20 years in an organization, 12 of that in an ice cream manufacturing plant, which was uh, a lot of fun way to start a career. Um, spent eight years in that organization's director of OD and then went out on my own in 97. And uh, similar to Mark, uh, background in psychology uh, and organizational development and um, have continued to do coaching work both at the team and individual level uh, in addition to my role as uh, managing director of TMS America. So really good to be here and um, looking forward to sharing the case study around using the TMP and q 2 in, in an actual coaching scenario that wasn't too long ago for me. Thank you, Tom. And just before we get started, um, thank you for those of you who've just highlighted that um, there is a little bit of an issue with the sound. Bethany, thank you for mentioning this. I've just moved my microphone a little bit closer, so hopefully that's a little better and a little clearer for you, because I know Tom's coming through nice and clearly. Let us know if that's not the case. Uh, and yeah, brilliant. So thrilled to have Tom join us today. Um, so in today's webinar, we're going to cover a variety of topics. And um, we'll be looking at different types of conversation that we can have when it comes to psychometrics. So I think it's really important that when we're talking about um, improving conversations at all levels within organizations, we can, we can actually label those types of conversations. We'll look at the idea of using psychometrics and particularly these profiles to generate coaching questions. Of course, the coach is only as good as the questions that they're able to ask. So we'll look at um, how, how can we do that in a, in a really effective and efficient way. And then we'll look at a couple of case studies. Um, so, so Tom's got a really uh, fascinating one to share with you around combining two of these tools, the team management profile and the opportunity orientation profile or the QO2. So, and then also I've got, I've got one I'd like to share as well, which is around a critical team decision in which we also use both of those tools as data to enhance a coaching conversation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, we've got plenty of time for questions and we'll do our very best to answer them in today's session um, both as we go and also um, uh, at the end of the session too. Okay so let's get started. Now um, on to conversations. So TMSDI was one of our strap lines is it's all about the conversation and I think 
one of the most important conversations that underpins a coaching relationship is actually being conscious and intentional about this very question that's on screen here. What kind of conversation do you want to have today? And a really good rule of thumb is actually to talk about how you want to talk about the thing you're there to talk about before getting into the conversation itself. Okay, so it's almost like this meta level of, of how are we going to set up this conversation? And because there are lots of ways that you might talk about the thing that you'd like to explore in, in, in a learning and development scenario, we've developed all kinds of labels for those kinds of conversations. And I thought it would be a nice thing maybe for us to start by simply exploring some of those familiar labels that we hear being used, particularly alongside psychometrics. So Tom and I will share some of our thinking around this, but equally we'd love to hear from you guys too. So I'm gonna share three words with you very shortly. And I'd love to hear just briefly, where do you see as the distinction between all of these, particularly when you're working with psychometrics like the, the TMS tools? Okay, so here's the question. What do you see as the differences between these types of conversations that are on screen? How do you distinguish between them? How do you differentiate between them? How do you label and position them? Okay, the, the, the umbrella term for today's webinar was coaching, but I think for many people they, they have, coaching is a very broad church and it can be mean different things to different people. Um, Tom, do you wanna just share a little bit about this, this first? Where do you yeah. see these, these sort of three yeah. types of conversations? Um, thanks, Mark. And I, I think uh, it's, it's, it is important to kind of distinguish, uh, especially in this type of a web meeting, uh, what kind of conversation you, you want to have. And I think many people in terms of the relationship that they at least initially have with team management systems or TMSDI <coughs> um, is that they come to us looking for a conversation that would be more in the debrief end of it. Um, and, and yet TMS is a lot of experience and the network has a lot of experience in feedback and coaching conversations as well. So the way that I look at these is how the how the this relates to the relative importance of the psychometric being used, so in this case the TMP or the QO2, compared to the context in which it is being used. And I would then uh, if I ordered them in terms of the importance of the context, I would um, put coaching, a coaching conversation as the context being of primary importance and the psychometric being second. So the psychometric for me in a coaching conversation is a listening filter. So I listen to the person talk, tell their story, and I'm using the TMP or the QO2 results as a filter to try and uh, listen through that and then bring that into the conversation later. Feedback, I use the psychometric as part of the explanation for what the feedback is. So feedback is always related to some kind of a context and the uh, psychometric TMP or QO2, it's part of the informing language or informing concepts that might explain why this type of feedback is being provided. And then the debrief end of it is typically the psychometric is for me is used is understood first and then applied to the context. So for what I'll be talking about today, there was really no traditional debrief because it was a coaching conversation. There wasn't a lot of feedback um, in, in the example I'll use. Um, it was definitely a coaching piece where I was using the results of the individual as a listening filter for me and then bringing that listening and my perceptions of what I was hearing to the conversation with the individual I was working with. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Really, really helpful and clear way to look at distinguishing between those things. And, and the idea of, of using tools as a filter is something that we'll come back to very shortly. Yeah. Um, again, likewise, for, for, from, from those of you who are joining the session, I think a few of you just joined in the last few minutes, we're looking at um, clarifying the difference between these three different types of conversations as a starter. Um, I'm happy to share a little bit from, from my perspective as well. I think, um, and it's, it's more of a, um, a confession, I guess, more than, more than any, any kind of insight. It's, it's more of a confession, which is, I spent a lot of my early career working with these tools, um, labeling them as coaching, 
and thinking that I was doing coaching with them when, I, when actually, if I was being honest with myself, I was probably doing something that was more akin to feedback, that was more akin to debrief. It was only later on uh, when I went to do my coach training where actually it became much clearer around some of these di distinctions and definitions and what I previously been calling coaching is actually much more akin to feedback and debrief where I was being you know following a process following a structured approach um, with a particular purpose in mind and that purpose was usually mine as opposed to the other person's I think a good rule of thumb and some ideas that can help clarify a lot of this is asking yourself or you know having when you're getting back into that conversation of what kind of conversation are we having today that question um, Number one, who is leading the content? Is it the facilitator or the coach or the mentor, or whoever, whatever label you choose to give yourself, or is it the person who's on the receiving end of, of having the profile? Uh, a second question which can be helpful here to differentiate between these three types of conversations is where are the questions being generated from? So typically in coaching, the questions um, may well come from the profile but very often they will be generated from whatever the, uh, the coach is hearing um, and reflecting the, that language back to the individual. And then also another question could be, who is driving the purpose of the conversation? So starting with a particular purpose in mind, chances are probably um, it might be more towards feedback or debrief, unless it's already been predefined by the two individuals, in which case it could well be coaching. Okay, so yeah, I think I think it's it's very for me the di distinction between these is often around who is driving, who is leading the conversation. If the conversation is being led by anyone else other than the end recipient of the profile, it's probably by a feedback or a debrief, and that's really important for people to know because those types of conversations can be enormously helpful and really really useful to get into the um, the depths of the profile, get some really rich insights there, and help somebody uncover some new learning. Whereas coaching can be quite different and might well involve putting the profile down and focusing in, in, in a more pure way on the individual and what they they're sharing or want to want to contribute okay yeah, mark can i just interject here for mm. yeah 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 um i think your your as we you named it a confession i think is is important because if you were um if you think you need to do a debrief of like as we've described it a debrief when you're using, let's say, the TMP or the QO2 in a coaching process, then that, if you were going to call it a debrief, it's certainly not the traditional type of debrief that typically we would provide in accreditation or something like that. Um, and I think it's important to be very careful with that because you do not want the psychometric to take over the conversation at the expense of the of the individual's context. And, you know, we've got a lot of experienced coaches here. I'm sure that's, uh, that's well understood. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, back to, back to the confession, that was absolutely where I was coming from. I must share as much as I can know, as much as I know about this profile with this person to prove that, you know, I am accredited and I'm certified and I've been on the course as opposed to really truly listening to what they wanted to try and cover in this, in the session. I was definitely coming from that perspective earlier on. Yeah. Um, should we move on and take a look at sort of generating questions and ideas for generating questions then in that case? So um, how to keep discussions flowing without constraining the, the dialogue in a conversation? So one of the great things about psychometrics is that they offer a window into a, a conversation and it could be a feedback conversation, it could be a debrief conversation, it could be a coaching conversation, but they offer ways of generating questions. And one of the wonderful things about these particular tools that we're going to be looking at is that the narrative of the reports is so rich that it lends itself to be able to generate coaching conversations right from the content. Okay, so there are lots of statements in these profiles, an awful lot of statements. Some of them could be quite gentle statements. You may prefer this or you, should, you, you might prefer that. But also some of them can be quite definite and quite um, uh, conscious statements. Regardless, 
uh, a great tip from working from these as a coaching perspective is to look at some of that narrative, as particularly if you've been drawn towards it by your coachee or your client, and consider, well, how might I convert one of these statements into a coaching question that would allow somebody to then um, get into a deeper understanding of that aspect of their profile? And these questions could be led by the coachee or the coach. Kind of, it kind of doesn't matter as long as we're clear about what kind of conversation we're having. Um, and I, 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 I'm going to put another one on, on screen here too. This is from the, the QO2 profile that we'll be looking at today. So if you've got the luxury of having two together, you've got a huge bank of data and narrative that allows you to just dig a little deeper into that individual's experience and allow them to share something with you. And through that, uh, enhance their own understanding of their profiles. I think an analogy I often use with these is that the profiles, whatever profile you're using, it's like a thread that can weave a conversation together. So if you're having more of a feedback style conversation, that thread might be something that you follow quite closely in quite a structured way, in quite a consistent way. Um, whereas you might well find in a coaching conversation that um, you find yourself putting the profile just down or to one side as your conversation heads off on a different journey based on what's come up in the coaching conversation. But then at an opportune moment, you can then pull on that thread and come back to the profile content if and when uh, you both feel it's appropriate. Okay, so a, a top tip is to look for questions in the data or in the narrative that can help enhance your conversation. Yeah. Anything you'd add to that, Tom? Um, I think it's uh, well. Yeah, I would just reiterate what you're what you're saying, um, and I'm sure those of us who have coached a, a fair bit, um, you kind of can you know your your questions are you have them in your back pocket, and that's where I think you're you're talking about, and then you're guided by the conversation and what's going to get get asked. So you might reshape a question that you've extracted from the person's profile data. But you're going to then massage it or change it, change it a little bit based on what you're hearing from somebody, uh, and you're doing that a little bit in the moment rather than in a let's say a, a planned way in some cases. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess a classic example could be, and, and this happens quite a lot if you're working with the profile. I'm sure those of you who are on the call will have had this, where people actually bring you straight to a page that's really resonated with them, or a chapter yes. or a paragraph, yes. and they go, "Look at this! This is this is totally me." And that's a, a wonderful gift in a coaching conversation because it's a window into a, you know, exploring yeah. a little further. Um, you know, yeah. they might be pointing at one of these paragraphs that are on on the screen here and say, "Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that." And then, of course, all you need to do is ask, "Well, tell me more about that," and that will lead you yeah. on to a coaching conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, Mark, if I had to make a uh, <laughs> my own confession, where are some of these because they're very practical points is my preferences are in the inner wheel of a polder maintainer so introversion creative beliefs and structured so i can have a tendency to get into the the nether world or you know the philosophical world of what's the what's the meaning of all this and sometimes i need to make sure my preparation is a little more practical because i can get off on a tangent to, and that that was a danger with the example i'll be sharing as well because we shared very similar preferences we could have talked about the meaning of life for for too long. <laughs> well, let's get it. Let's get. Um, let's get towards. Uh, let's get towards the, the case study that you got to share because it's one of the. It's one of the most interesting ones I've I've come across in sort of TMS history in sort of fifteen or sixteen years. Before we do though, just a bit of context because I know that the um, uh, the participants who are joining today's session, not all of them are accredited in both of these tools. I think most are accredited in at least one of them, but not all. So let's have a quick recap on on that. And one of the great things to do. Uh, is is that we have this wonderful model that puts everything in context. Um, how do they all fit together? So this is this is called the McCann Workplace Behaviour Pyramid, um, and this is such a helpful visual. And this comes back to something Tom was talking about earlier: this idea of using tools as filters, as listening tools. And this, you know, as, as we can see here on, on screen, is presented like a, a a pyramid, but it's actually more like a prism. Um, that if you shine light through it shining light onto certain behavior at work you can use different lenses to do that and in doing that you can get a, a slightly different understanding so at the top of the pyramid we have 
preferences as measured by the team management profile. And we would suggest these are the most observable, um, this, the surface level behavior that you like to see. And as you go sort of further down through to the depths of this pyramid model, uh, we're actually tapping into behaviors that are less and less observable and less and less likely to change over time. Okay, so we're going to tap into two of these different lenses today, but I thought this is just a helpful way of putting behavior into context. And we can see here we've got three tools that allow us to do that. Now, with the team management profile, we can break those down even further. So we have three almost sub lenses to look through. We can look through the lens of the types of work and have conversations about purpose and priorities and the work that needs doing and the work that, that I prefer and you prefer and, and we have to focus on. We can also have conversations about behavior and looking at those four work preference scales, looking at preferences and the full spectrum of behavior that might lie across all four of those areas. And then finally, we have the lens of team management role preferences with that model on the right hand side, looking at um, you know, to what extent do, do I have a, a, a combination of preference towards certain tasks and certain behaviors at work. We could stop there. That gives us plenty to work with when we're having these conversations. But uh, we're looking at a combination of tools today. So the other tool that we're going to be looking at is something called the QO2 or the Opportunity Orientation Profile. Now, a very brief potted history of this tool for those of you who are not accredited in it. Um, it, it, it was uh, developed by uh, Dr. Dick McCann, who was one of the co-authors of the Team Management Profile. And in his work with the Team Management Profile, he found that there were other factors at play. And so he turned to what, what else could we be measuring here? And in doing that, he, he studied the work of um, two psychologists who were responsible for a tool known as the Big Five. Now, broadly speaking, uh, the idea there was to try and condense personality into five dimensions. And when Dick McCann looked at this, he found that four of those broadly were tapped into by the team management profile, but there was one missing. Um, and so he developed his own version of that, which was, how does this present itself at work? And uh, Dick McCann's version of contextualizing this was around risk orientation. In other words, how oriented are you towards or away from risk? Are you more opportunities focused and likely to see opportunities? Or are you more obstacles focused and likely to look at what could go wrong um, before considering opportunities? Okay, and you could stop there. However, um, Dr. McCann went off and developed a series of really interesting subscales. So not only does somebody get a, a sort of overall measure of opportunities versus obstacles balance, but then a, a score as a percentage around these five subscales, moving towards goals, multi-pathways, optimism, fault finding, and time focus. Okay, that is absolutely in a nutshell um, the two tools that we're going to be looking at today. And with all that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Tom now to look at a particular scenario. Okay, uh, thanks, Mark. So this is the the nitty gritty of things, um, <clears throat> and most of the coaching work that I do um, will fall into one on one, and it's developmental coaching. Um, Back early in my career, I did a fair bit of what I would call fix-it coaching. You know, you get a call from a manager and say, can you fix this person? Um, <laughs> and now I kind of gravitate more to developmental one-on-one -on -one and then team coaching as well. But in this particular case, it was a new senior manager, small boutique branding and marketing firm, so a very small organization. And um, the person wasn't sure if they fit in the role um, or needed to find a way to add more val or add value that was more closely to match their skills, but also that matched what uh, they described it like who they were, who they uh, were in the in the work world. Uh, and the coaching framework that I often like to use is I'll set it up. We do the onboarding piece, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, and then I'll do three one-hour coaching calls with options for two more sets of calls. So it could be a potential of nine uh, coaching calls. But we have a check-in at each um, of the three calls and say, okay, how are we doing here? And one of the critical things for me is that um, before each call, a scenario, a work scenario is provided by uh, the my coachee uh, so that it is a, um, it illustrates the goals that we're trying to work towards. 
as an actual example uh, in, from their work world. Uh, I tend to be a social pragmatist, which means I balance psychology and social construction, and it needs to be very practical. So that's why I ask for these scenarios, um, and it helps to ground, ground me as well. So let's look at the data that we um, ended up having. Um, I typically, in my coaching, like to use the TMP and the QO2 and then some form of uh, 360 data, whether that's an actual um, assessment or perhaps interviews, which I'm sure many of the people on this call do. So the individual had already done a TMP and had a, a, a debrief session with somebody else who we knew, a network member, uh, who was also um, at arm's length from the organization. And this is the results from the TMP. So uh, reporter, advisor, outer wheel, and quite high net scores. So the, the global distribution is at the bottom there. So first of all, you've got a, um, a relatively unique uh, uh, profile in that outer wheel reporter advisor with very strong net scores. So you don't see a lot of these preferences pop up. Those of you who work with the TMP will probably recognize that. Um, the lucky thing for me is, as I said earlier, my preferences, well, lucky to a certain extent, uh, my preferences are introversion, creative beliefs, and structured. Uh, so in the maintaining area, but in my immediate family, my uh, uh, partner and spouse has outer wheel reporter advisor preferences. So does my daughter and so does my youngest son. So while we may have kind of a freakish family preference wise, <laughs> Um, when I saw his results, I thought, well, yeah, I can have some experience with, uh, with this. And I was able to rely on those sto stories, um, but certainly relatively unique and almost opposite from what you would see in the uh, TMP global distribution. Now, when I see that, and based on my, my experience with these, uh, this particular profile, I've often found that this particular uh, preference will exhibit or comment that they're not sure if they fit in the organization or there's some kind of a misalignment with what organizations try and do in general. And it's almost a philosophical difference between what they're put on this earth to do and what organizations are put on this earth to do. So we had this result, I knew he'd been uh, debriefed in this, and then we got the QO2 uh, done. and. Um, uh, when that result came up, uh, Marg, if you can move us to that, uh, it was like, whoa, boy, we have some really unique data. Um, and so the on the left here is the individual's QO2 results. It was different than anyone I had seen before. And then on the right, right we have the global medians. Um, and when you're using the QO2, it's very important to have some comparative numbers. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, those comparative numbers are typically the global medians. If it's with a group, then you have comparative numbers with the group itself. Now, because this was a coaching conversation and, or a coaching initiative, uh, I'm as Mark has you know, put those three terms out there, I knew that I wasn't going to be doing a typical debrief or what we can call a typical debrief of the QO2. But what I had done in advance, and I always do this anyway, but uh, he had his um, uh, QO2, but I'd also sent him the global medians and the graphs that we have here and, the, and asked him to read through the uh, discovery workbook so that he was well prepared in case he had his own questions. Now that's one of the things I do find in coaching as well is people tend to be, uh, expect to do more preparation for um, a coaching than they might do for a debrief. They tend to expect more from you as a facilitator in a debrief conversation than a coaching conversation. So when we hit our first, after the onboarding hit our first uh, uh, call, he was very well prepared and he did want to talk about the QO2, because when you look at these numbers compared to the global medians, um, so he had an overall QO2 of 0 0.4. So when you look at the graph on the bottom right, that's into the probably 0 point something or other uh, representative sample. And his 
subscore, uh, subscale scores moving towards goals, multi-pathways, time focus, and optimism were quite different than the global medians. Now, when you look at the his results, you might be drawn to, oh boy, that 9% moving towards goals, that's got to be what's uh, important. Or the 18% in optimism compared to the global median, that's got to be what's important. And it was really important for me to put those assumptions aside. And as we talked about, let, the, let him talk about his context and see where it was leading us. And so when you see results like this, like part of me is thinking, oh my geez, I found a unicorn here. Look at these unique results. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and then you start to make all your assumptions and it's really important to put that aside. So Mark, we can move to the conclusions, or not the conclusions, but what happened. Um, you know, we did have a very high net scores in the TNP and um, typically underrepresented in organizations and a very low QO2. So, but the QO2 measures normal range of behavior in organizations, whether it's very low or very high. It, from a high perspective, I've worked with people who have a QO2 of 15 and, and that's as unique as a 0 0.4. Um, in fact, the instrument cuts off the number at 15, even though it could go uh, to infinity. So, um, but it's all within the normal range of, of behavior. So as I listened to my coachee talk about the uh, scenarios and I really trying to listen carefully to him and trying to make connections between okay, results in the QO2 results and using those results as a filter, it became evident to me, and I needed to check that of course, that the story he was telling was being uh, was telling me seemed to play out most mostly from the belief space preference of the TMP. And one of the things with the belief space preference that I have often found is that that preference will often be very focused on the process of work and how that connects to them. So result of the work is, I won't say secondary, but it's not as important as it may be for individuals with a preference in the analytic decision-making construct. Um, so, and where this, where I, what I heard from the blue space preference was his frustration with uh, how their consulting work in branding and, um, and uh, was re received by the organizations that they, that he worked with and some of the scenarios he'd had some conflict. And this was in the midst of the pandemic, so there was other challenges involved with that as well. So he was more, he was expressing frustration with the whole kind of work end of it. Like, I'm telling you what the red thread is for what you're telling me about your organization, how it can be branded. And he was very brilliant that way. But um, it seemed to, that unique story that he would have for the organization seemed to be compromised by, okay, and now we've got to do all the, the detail of our branding strategy. So that's where the blue space, where I heard the blue space thing playing out. And then what came forward in the QO2 was fault finding. And it wasn't one of the ones in terms of the numbers that would have jumped out for me, but he was quite tough on himself when he didn't get the results that he wanted. Uh, so his fault finding, and this I find is a critical thing with fault finding or can be, is is it directed inward or is it directed outward? Uh, by outward, I mean, you know, projects that you're doing or other people, or is it directed inward? And for him, the story he told was his fault finding, which is a relatively high number compared to, to the medians, was directed inward. And then as I listen more to the stories, that seemed to then play out and producing challenges in the flexible preference, um, as well as optimism and moving towards goals. So kind of how it would play out is, it is brilliance of putting together a, a brand story for an organization. Um, he would get frustrated by more or less the meaning of the work and wanting that, that deep story that he could discover to be played out honestly with his clients. And then he would, when it didn't turn out quite the way he wanted to, he would start blaming himself. And then he would lose um, both the, um, 
his feeling of worth, self-worth, so his optimism would go down, and then he, he would demotivate himself. Um, so his moving towards goals, energy seemed to be um, uh, compromised or lowered, let's say. And his flexible preference just kind of ran the show where he would, then would be all over the place trying to find answers. Uh, and that would then confuse the, uh, the potential client. So we were able to, to talk about the belief-based preference. And rather than him finding meaning so much in the outcomes of his work, as in the process of, of his work. And by that, we meant the people that he would work with in his organization and how he saw his own work. So it was much more about the process. From a very practical perspective, he went out and got some resources in, that basically were about time management for his particular uh, situation. And he found that quite helpful as well, although that was a little bit tough for him because his flexible preference was quite strong. As we moved through the calls, um, we did get more into the T or the, uh, in particular, the QO2. And we were able to talk about his low QO2 as typically being, or for him anyway, being positive in their um, client relationships. So that he could be quite critical of um, his own ideas um, and we'll say more risk averse than other people. Um, and if we look at the global medians, but that was good because he could then position all the positives and negatives of the branding strategy they might um, uh, they might want to put out for this particular organization. So while the numbers initially to him seemed to be quite concerning, when we were able to break it down and talk about fault finding being uh, internally directed, and it, was there a way to move that um, either externally? And what he ended up landing on was a cl much closer relationship with his key colleague, who interestingly, we ended up doing a QO2 with him. QO2, so it was in the two key people had very low QO2s. But uh, to put more emphasis on the working relationship with his close colleague, and then to separate out the work a little bit more so that he could do more of the conceptual work, and his colleague would do more of the client facing work. Um, but those combinations for me were, were fascinating. Um, but as well, in terms of the type of conversation we were having, I needed to listen really well to make sure that the data conversation. And we ended up only doing three calls. We are going to do a follow-up call uh, in the fall. And he actually wants to do the QO2 again. Um, and we'll see how that uh, that plays out. Um, but for me, I really like the TMP QO2 together because one of the things that with there is no correlations between these two uh, uh, profiles. So for instance, you can have a high QO2 or low, low QO2 anywhere around the model. Many people will make the assumption that north wheel TMP preferences will have high QO2s and south wheel TMP preferences will have lower QO2s. My preferences are in the south wheel. I have a QO2 of 3.9, so higher there, but there's no correlation. So you can have two people with thruster organizer uh, preferences, one with a high QO2 and one with a low QO2. And the conversations that you can generate around that can be just absolutely deeply insightful for people. That's a one-on-one -on -one example. Um, Mark, do you want to talk about your working with two people? Of course, thank you, Tom. Before we do, I, um, uh, I've had some com comments coming in already saying this is really interesting. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for that, Tom. Um, as just, just as you were talking about there, about those, the, the inference that these two things could link to each other and might be predictive of, of one another. So in other words, a North Wheel team management profile shape would lead to a very high QO2 profile absolutely not the case all combinations possible and that the neat thing about this model is that this idea of you can see behavior filtering through from the base of this pyramid right through to the um, the apex of the pyramid so in other words that the the overall behavior that you might see at the team management level will have already been filtered by that individual at a risk orientation level so that thruster organizer preference could be driven driving things and projects and people forward towards opportunities, or it could be about 
locating and finding faults and problems with things at the same time. The same amount of energy could be applied, but it would come through as, as slightly different behavior. Um, so it, it is worthwhile looking at those combinations. And if you've got the, the luxury of having the data, really, really helpful. One of the things I wanted to ask you, Tom, before, um, before we look at the other scenario is, um, I'm conscious you were talking there about the, <laughs> the individual saying that they were a little alarmed by <laughs> the results when they saw them. How did you manage that in the conversation? How did you manage to get them to understand that in a different way than going, oh my gosh, this looks, yeah. this looks odd? Yeah, well, I, I do find the QO2 material, especially the uh, the workbook that comes with it, very helpful because it does position the into the um, <clears throat> the history and development of it very well. So it talks about it in the normal range of behavior. But it's also for me what when you're in a coaching discussion and um, uh, why you you so he said, well, what does this mean to me, uh, like? You know, you're looking at a nine percent um, for uh, his result and an eighty-one percent meeting. He said, "Like, is this bad?" <clears throat> and I said, "Well, I mean, you're here. You're working in an organization. You're doing the organization's doing fine. So let's just talk about what's going on for you, and then we'll see what the meaning of this instrument has, rather than taking on the meaning of the instrument first." Hmm. Um, so as you had said earlier, sometimes you know you put the uh, the profile aside. And I find with results like this or very low or very high, it can be very important to put the profile aside and then focus on the context and then interpret the meaning of the profile through that context. And then it more, it normalizes it more than the numbers might. Yeah, really, really And he nice. was fine to let it go, let it go. And um, I think this, this you know, because. Go on, Tom. Go ahead. I think there's something about human nature, isn't there? Is when you look at numbers and you look at data, the automatic assumption is that low means bad and high means good. That's right. And when we do accreditation, as I'm sure you do, uh, that's one of the things that we will point out that people make that assumption. Um, <laughs> but if you've worked with somebody who has a, a TMP of 15 and somebody who has a, a TMP of 0.4, um, they both have their wonderful parts to it and both have their huge challenges, just like all of us do. So it's important to hear the big story that they have and the importance of those stories and then interpret the, the data through that story rather than the other way around. Thanks, Tom. We've got a question here, actually, just before we move on. And this is from Paul. I'm just going to just tab back to this so that you can see the combination we were looking at. There's a lot going on with this case study. There's the initial piece of information with the team management profile that Tom covered. Where we've got some really quite rare and also quite strong preferences coming through here in the in the team management profile data combined with that uh, QO2 result. And Paul's question, Tom, was, um, did you do anything to cross check that he had not mess misread the questions in order to get this kind of result? Did you did you do anything there? Any any kind of checking in? Well, my check-in in those in these cases is um, if so, there was nothing concrete. Um, I I go in with the assumption, and this has a lot to do with the preparation and the onboarding end of it. When you talk about the profiles that you're going to use, and I find this uh, you know typical is that you trust the person, uh, especially in a coaching scenario, because they are interested in, in the data. But for me, in a, in a coaching situation, the only check I would do is, are they interested in the data and are they asking questions that would be relevant to the data? Somebody who has, let's say, tried to fudge it or something like that, they're usually not that interested in the results. This person was very interested and had done their preparation very well. So in that case, um, I, I was fine with, uh, very confident that it was accurate data. Thanks, Tom. So I've got a cheek. I've got a cheeky question here. It's been labelled as a cheeky question by the person that's asked it, Rodi. We like cheeky questions, and actually, some of the best coaching questions are cheeky questions. So thank you for posting this one, Rodi. Rodi says, or asks, um, if behaviour filters up through values and risk orientation, what would you say can be revealed by using just the TMP on its own? What you were talking about today appears to be much richer. 
Do you want to take that one first? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I agree that it is much richer um, it, when you, but to me, it's much richer through the combination. Um, so, like when, when we accredit people, as I'm sure the same thing when, when you do, Mark, if you accredit people in the TMP and the QO2 together and they ask, well, what's it, what's it like to, what is somebody like who has Explore Promoter and, and high QO2? Well, there is nothing you can really write down about that because the correlations and the connections are so specific to that context. Um, so it's the combination of the two that make, that I find make the, it richer. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that any one of these elements are um, more impactful um, or let's say more significant than any of the others. But when you start putting the combinations together, uh, that's when the conversation becomes richer. And I would say that of any assessment. If you add uh, an assessment, two assessments, you have a richer conversation. Now, I'll, I'll just say one other thing to that. I, 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 I never go beyond, I only use two psychometric assessments. I know I've heard of some people that use eight or nine assessments, and for me, that's just impossible to work with. Um, and I find it, it starts to dictate the story too much. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, because I think that's sometimes, that's sometimes the challenge here when you add up so much data it starts to, well, it's, a, it, it's exactly like adding lots of lenses into a pair of glasses. It starts to cloud your vision about what you're actually looking at. Um, and yeah, yeah, so it, it's helpful to have some, some clarity, but yeah, too much data can often then start to drive you down a particular course and maybe, you know, you, you might over-prepare or overthink what is this present, what is the story here, what's, this, what's being presented, as opposed to what the true story is from the individual themselves. Brilliant. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on this, though, Mark? Yeah, my take on Rodi's question. Um, I think, well, for me, both, well, all of these tools, they're essentially mirrors. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the, um, you know, the, the sort of systems coaching approach and constellations. And, and regardless of what you're looking at, all of these things are mirrors that you can show to somebody. And in, in that process you can reveal behavior to them that they may otherwise be unaware of or that you can reveal motivations to them and i think that's the real thing here we're talking about the motivations behind behavior that they may be un otherwise unaware of so particularly in in tom's example of this um really interesting um team management profile um set of scores actually as, as tom explained the process of the coaching there helped that individual make sense of their reality in a different way than the way they've been making sense of it so far because they had a, a new mirror to look into so yeah i, I think I, I i do i do take um Rody's point now i think when when we get into the level of the, the qo2 we are measuring much deeper aspects of the psyche much deeper aspects of identity and we, we are getting into identity work there and it's it's not always the case that you're in that space when you're working with the team management profile. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Liz, just a comment here from Liz. Liz has said, um, I find that sometimes people get worried about having a split wheel until you start to explain the um, advantages of the spread of preference, <clears throat> which again, I think is a really nice way of looking at it. So often it's, it, it is the facilitator or the coach's role to help that individual make sense of it, whether you're doing feedback or a debrief or coaching, actually helping them understand the, the data can be a really good thing so that they don't walk away with a misinformation or a, an incorrect interpretation of things. Yeah. yeah. To that point, the, the Mark, uh, as well, with the, with the TMP, because it's got the foundational model, the types of work model, it's mm -hmm. fairly inclusive in terms of preference, because right? everybody can see that all of these work preferences are, or the work functions have value therefore by default the assumption is made that the preference have value and they and they do but when you start talking in the qo2 about optimism or fault finding especially optimism um that's that's a more sensitive topic um so you are at a different level of conversation and one of the things we find is that um if people are very comfortable using the tmp if they think using the QO2 is going to be just like the TMP, it's usually a shock that the conversation is, is at a 
um, much more deeper level. Uh, so you need to be able to prepare yourself for that. And it's a, it's, it is a different conversation because of the sensitivity of, uh, in particular, the subscales of optimism and fault finding mm. and the very strong assumption that low numbers are bad and high numbers are good. And if you're working with a team like or a group like you did, Mark, challenging conversations, which uh, you need to facilitate, you need to be able to facilitate and jump in with people. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for those questions as well. Thank you, folks. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. We're going to move on and take a look at a slightly different scenario, um, which is one that's actually, uh, again, confession time. This was this was neither a coaching conversation, nor a debrief, nor a feedback. But it turned into one of those things. Um, and it was a conversation I had some what, 10 or so years ago. I was working with um, a small consultancy practice. And the I just happened to be in the, in the room with them as they were talking this through. But we'd very uh, recently gone through their team management profile data. And we'd also done their Curio2 results as well. So like, like uh, in Tom's um, scenario, we had the luxury of all of that to work with. And here was what was going on. So these were two base, the two founders of the company we were talking to. And one of them had gone away to a networking event. I think it was on a ship or something. It was one of these really um, uh, incredibly exciting and, and very luxurious networking events where you, where you all gather together for three or four days and have a series of conversations. And they've come back to a follow up and tell their partner, their business partner about how things had gone. Now, um, in their mind, things had gone amazingly well. And actually they'd had a kind of earth shattering conversation, which they believed, and in their words, was gonna transform their business. It was gonna take them into the, into the next level of where they wanted to be in terms of growth, um, in terms of their, their vision for their consultancy practice. And they'd met somebody who was so enthusiastic about what they were doing that they uh, had offered to merge the two businesses together combine forces and create something much bigger, much better. Um, their colleague, I was watching them on the other side of the table, was noticeably quiet and was sort of sitting back and kind of going, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, yes, yeah. And before I tell you what happened next, I'm going to show you some of their data. So again, on in your chat boxes, names have been changed to protect the innocent here. So this isn't, this isn't their real names, but let's call them Andreas and Christina for now. Um, what are you noticing so far about some of these? What are you noticing so far about potential differences between these two um, incredibly successful consultants? Um, Tom, how about for you? Is there anything, anything jumping out? Well, I've got kind of the, uh, you know, the classic North wheel, South wheel piece, uh, the share the analytic and flexible, but, uh, um, you know, extroversion, introversion. So <laughs> the explorer promoter, I'm assuming that was, well, here I am making an assumption, right? I'm assuming that the explorer promoter was the one that saw all the ideas could be dead wrong. Um, and, uh, Christina controller inspector wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that that idea would work before jumping into it. But, uh, yeah. uh, your description, you if it is those two, the classic, I am wrong. I'd love to say you were, but you're not. Absolutely uh, correct. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Correct. So it, it's often a classic challenge between north and south wheel preferences. Um, let's jump in from the north wheel and and uh, let's check how deep the water is before we jump in. Yeah. And that, and and an interesting thing that was often sort of a, just as an aside note here, uh, there's often an assumption that people with similar preferences will use that as a point to. Um, to build a relationship. Whereas actually the reality in a lot of the case, in a lot of cases is that similar preferences can very often butt heads. They'll just butt heads in a similar way. So in this case, these two individuals, uh, brilliant together, wonderful working team. They were, they were quite a larger team than this, but even just if you consider them as a team of two, they cover so many different areas of the wheel between them. And they meet around the analytical piece, as, as Tom was just saying. And yeah, all of their big, discussions and heated arguments were all around each of them trying to convince the other using research and pros and cons and evidence that their point of view is the correct one. Um, 
and very often it would end up as downplayed because you know you, it was it was a very, a very very interesting to observe that analytical preference being used in that way. So we also had their QO2 data, which was as follows. So we have Andreas on the left, who was the explorer from Motors, we just remembered there um, from just before. And we have Christina on the right hand side with the um, uh, uh, this, the interesting split wheel controller inspector preference. <clears throat> Yeah, just, just before we get into this, Paul's just mentioned in the chat box. Um, throughout my working life, I have often recruited people that cover off my lack of preference. Yeah, absolutely. It's key to success, Paul. Yeah, so Tom, what, what I, and again, what, what are you noticing here? What are you seeing? Well, so I'm seeing results that would uh, <laughs> amplify the assumptions that we typically make about the QO2 and the T, mm. which, I would imagine in your uh, perspective, you've got to, um, you know, I won't say work against that, but make sure that you're um, don't enhance those assumptions um, uh, and then direct it towards the conversations and them, themselves. Um, but it, uh, so you've got kind of classic examples, right? North wheel, south wheel, higher QO2, low, lower QO2. It's the, um, from a preference perspective, a psychometric perspective, the classic scenario of where conflict could re, um, happen. And if it stays as negative conflict, it could be highly problematic. But if it stays as comp or complementary or constructive conflict, then you've probably got some really good um, and sustainable development that could happen. Thank you. The bit I know of you, my guess is it was sustainable development that happened. <laughs> it was sustainable development that happened. So yes, um, yeah, really interesting comparison here. And again, those lenses working absolutely beautifully and playing out in front of me in this room. And they, they got into a bit of an argument, which was along the lines of Andrea saying to Christina, this is, you know, I, 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 where's, where's the enthusiasm here? We're going we're gonna to take our business into the, into the next level. And Christina was there going, yeah, hmm, hmm, yes, hmm. And just I started asking all these questions. Where did, and where, where did you meet them again? What's their background? Uh, and what, you know, how solvent is their business? Um, what are they, what are they working on at the moment? Do they really have alignment with us? And there was lots of this, um, lots of questioning coming back from Christina, not necessarily negativity, but just really wanting to know more. And Andreas had to perceive that as criticism. And they, they essentially got into an argument, which, which was, oh, Christina, this is typical of you. you. You're never enthusiastic about my ideas. And, you know, sometimes I just don't know why I bother. And so we, event, we eventually, I was there just observing this in the background. And as you might expect, it happened at some point. One of them, I can't remember which one, turned to me and said, Mark, what do you think? <laughs> so I thought, OK, right, I could, didn't really want to get involved in this. But luckily, I have a secret weapon, which is, um, we've got all of this data to work with. I said, well, let's have a, let's have five minutes. So we went, we went off, we're in the UK. So of course we made a cup of tea. And then um, we, I said, well, let's have a look back at some of the profiles we were looking at the other day. And let's just see if we can explain anything that's going on here through those. So that's exactly what we did. We went back, we went back to their team management profile data, looked at what was the other person hearing versus what was really being said. Likewise, we looked at the QO2 data and looked at, well, what were you hearing there versus what was really being said? And we, we were able to, it was almost a mediation rather than a coaching conversation. I wasn't really, you know, coaching at all, really. I was just, I was just trying to reflect some of this back to them. Um, and what ended up happening in the end was uh, Christina persuaded Andreas to go off, do a huge piece of due diligence around that other company. And surprise, surprise, discovered that that company that they really wanted to merge with was about to go bankrupt. And had they completed that merger as Andreas wanted, they would have taken them down with them. Uh, so a huge piece of learning for both of them, both, particularly for Christina in terms of positioning her language and positioning her message, but also for Andreas in terms of listening in the right way and hearing what was really being said. Yeah, we, it worked really well to help um, diffuse that situation and then disentangle it. Yes, goodness me. So. Um, We've got we've covered an awful lot, and I'm just I noticed that the hour's almost up. So we're, uh, Tom and I are happy to stick around for any questions. Before we do, just a quick note: um, I know many of you who are on the line work as team coaches. We haven't touched on that today, but 
just FYI, both Tom and I offer a, a number of different visuals that can be particularly helpful for uh, looking at um, uh, team development in, in the team coaching uh, light. So one of the great things about having psychometrics as a backdrop to team coaching is the notion that you've got you have that mirror that I was talking about, the mirror that you can hold, hold up to the system and reveal the system to itself. Um, so we can produce these kind of customized reports for any size team if you're working with the team management profile. Plus, if you're working with the um, QO2 profile, we can also produce specialized customized reports for these as well. So you can have team maps for the QO2 that plot out an average team's percentages, an average QO2 as well as breakdowns on each of the different scales that map out the team average and the worldwide indicator. If you've got really geeky clients or if you're really geeky about some of this, you can really get into some, um, some rich discussions and content around, around these. It's a really comprehensive place to start when you're working with a team coaching initiative. Okay. Uh, Mark, these graphics are, uh, especially for the QO2, are critically important because as I'd mentioned earlier, you need a comparison point for the QO2 because um, the medians aren't near the, uh, the midpoint. Um, and so you need that comparative end of it. So when you're looking at the, uh, the graphic at the bottom right there, being able to see where people lie. Um, and this would be very important if you were doing virtual work. Um, when I work with the QO2 with teams, we will do a version of the human continuum exercise, or that's what we call it, the lineup exercise. Yeah. For virtual work, this is this graphic for the QO2 is critically important, probably more important than with than for the TMP because you really have to have something to compare your data to, and with a team, yeah, this does this helps uh, do that. Yeah, super important to be, and as we can see, Tom mentioned this earlier yeah. on, 100% is not best, and 100% is also not the average, as we can see on some of these uh, the, uh, these charts, and and yeah. so you can get that sense of relativity around all the different scales with these. Um, with these customized team reports. Great, so Rodi has just asked a question. We'll get into some questions very shortly for those of you who wanna stick around and ask any. Um, will you be sending the slides afterwards? Absolutely, happy to share some of those. Um, and and we, we will be recording this as well. Uh, Rodi also said, I could listen to you both all day, which is very nice. Thank you, Rodi. Um, <laughs> we'll happily stick around for a little while longer if anyone does have any specific questions that you want to ask of Tom or I around any of the topics we've covered today. Um, and please just pop those into the chat box uh, as you do so. In the meantime, uh, just a few um, dates for your diary. We have accreditations running in all of those tools um, across August, September into October. We've also got a special digital body language webinar coming up on the 4th of September. Um, look out for more from our team on that if you want to join us for, for that one. We're going to be talking about this brave new world that we find ourselves in of, of almost exclusive remote working and uh, what does that mean for us in terms of language and body language? What do we lose? What do we gain? Um, Tom, how can people find out more about what you do? If they're, if they're yeah, I'm, the first um, time? Yep. Um, well, uh, I, Mark, if you're following up with people, um, you can include my email address. But in terms of the accreditation stuff, the people from uh, the Americas area, it's on our website, but you'll be hearing from us as, as well. But more than happy to, uh, if somebody wants to shoot me an email um, or go to our website and put an inquiry in, uh, TMS-Americas, I'm more than happy to, uh, to um, connect back in. But any of this stuff, because it's like you, Mark, uh, we're both a bit of a, a psychology geeks, although I have, I do now, Try and balance the social construction end of it, um, uh, but more than happy to talk more with people if you're interested. Brilliant! I'll definitely include that, Tom, and, and as, as, as with the follow-up, anybody, um, if anybody does. Bethany said, "Love psychology geeks. Excellent. Always happy to share psychology." Um, some more messages coming in. Um, massive thanks to you both. Really interesting and engaging. I really appreciate these webinars. Uh, we have a thank you from Adriana in Chile. Uh, thank you from Stig over in Oslo. Very interesting, says Stig. Um, and yeah, Paul says, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, see you on the 4th of September. Uh, Izumi says, I've just got to go now, but also says thank you very much and all the best. Right, well, all that remains for me to say, I guess, at this stage is a, a very um, huge 
thank you to Tom for joining us today. It's been a pleasure, as always, uh, working with you, sir. And thank you for sharing what an incredible story of um, of of working with information from both of those uh, those tools today. Yep, there there are unicorns out there. There are. <laughs> Yeah, the, and they're as cool. They're as cool as what we imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to the, the rest of you for joining us. Thank you for your comments, questions, thoughts. Always a pleasure to, to see you with us. And um, we will um, we'll be in touch very soon. In the meantime, you know where to find us if you want to have a conversation about any of this. And um, yeah, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks for stopping by. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.